That's a clown question, bro. Hey, what's up on yes! So I'm gonna kick some dirt. He gets on base. Just a bit outside. I'm not the type of player that's gonna be Johnny Hustle. And if you don't want me to watch the ball, you can go get it out of the ocean. And welcome back to Above Replacement Radio, part two of episode 88. We're here talking about the 2008 Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, Daniel Curran, how, what are we thinking about this team? Well, I mean, they were absolutely nothing before the 2008 season. Uh, they went 66 and 96 in 2007. That was about par for the course. Um, for what they've done in their first decade since their inception uh, in 1998. They were last in the AL East, and they also had the worst record in all of baseball in 2007. So, I mean, they were quite literally not expected to do anything. And, uh, yeah, in fact, the, the, the Devil Rays, uh, as they were called before 2008, had never won more than 70 games in a season uh, in their first decade as a franchise. So they obviously needed to, to give St. Petersburg – something to be excited about. I mean, like 70 wins, if that's your, pla- if that's the, if that's your peak uh, after a decade, you're doing something severely wrong. And uh, well, maybe it was the name because they changed their name from the Tampa Bay Devil Rays to just the Tampa Bay Rays. They also made a couple moves during the off season. They traded three players to the twins for Jason Bartlett and Matt Garza. And they also signed Cliff Floyd uh, as a free agent. It was kind of, you know, he was past his prime, but it's a guy to have. I mean, if you're the Rays at this point, you know, obviously you're trying to compete at some point, but at the same time, you're trying to get people to come to your stadium and Cliff Floyd can do that. And um, there was hope in the beginning of the season for a team that had been perpetually terrible since their birth. It was pretty promising when the Rays were hovering 500 for their first few games of the season. After starting five and six, the Rays were in a pitcher's duel in an attempt to break even. And B.J. Upton came up in the fifth inning of game number 12 on the year, looking to capitalize on an already productive inning. Hmm. All right, so first and second, two men out. The eighth man to come up in the inning is B.J. Upton. Here they go. And a drive to deep left field. This will be his first. Turning and looking, Scott. It's out of here. A three-run homer for B.J. Upton. And the Rays bust it open. Six-nothing. Well, the one thing that Burris had been doing so well against B.J. Upton in this at-bat. And in the previous at-bats, he got him on the backdoor breaking ball the first time and then was busting him in on the the hands the last couple of times. This time, though, for the first time in the at-bat and the first time today, he left the pitch out over the middle part of the plate. B.J. Upton did not miss it. He crushed it. So B.J. Upton with a big three-run home run there. And although he had the exclamation point in the inning, the guy who started, who the guy who got it started and kept the line moving, was a young rookie by the name of Evan Longoria. It'll be Evan Longoria to lead off. Longoria takes ball four, so the fourth walk allowed by Burris comes leading off the fifth inning. So now Evan Longoria, who has struck out and walked, scored a run. And a line drive base hit to the left of Mora. Gomes will turn second and hold. So Longoria is on for the second time in this inning. That time a base hit into left. So Evan Longoria contributing to the inning there, just like he would do throughout the start of his rookie campaign. The Rays won that game 6-2. to two and they got to 500 on the year. Although Longoria had himself an inning, there was still one thing he hadn't done yet in his big league career, and the very next day, he looked to achieve that very milestone. So Evan Longoria gets his first big league home run against the New York Yankees in Tropicana Field, and he was killing it in the majors. Throughout his first month in the big leagues, he was slashing 273, 388, 
527 for a 915 OPS. This game with a 390 Woba and 127 weighted runs created plus and 0.9 F4. That ranked 29th in the majors. And mind you, he did this in just 63 plate appearances. This is through a month. So a lot of people had like 120, pretty much double that. Uh, and Evan Longoria was just as good as everyone else. Meanwhile, on the field, the Rays were riding a three-game win streak going into a three-game weekend series at home against the defending champion Boston Red Sox. In the first game of the series, the Rays had the winning run and scoring position in the 11th inning with Nathan Haynes batting. Are you on this? I don't hear it. Oh, yeah, no, there's no audio on that. I forgot to mention that. Okay. Yeah. We can do comment commentary. <laughs> and do the his put in like the just the Tom Brenneman uh driving to deep left field, even though it has absolutely zero relation. <laughs> Yeah, there is no audio over this clip, and uh, Haynes drives a single into right field. The winning run is coming around, and the Rays have won game one of this series against the Red Sox. Look at that. Yeah. They seem very happy about it. <laughs> so the Rays take game one against the Red Sox. Uh, a big walk-off there from Nathan Haynes. And in the second game, infielder Akanori Iwamura came up with a man on in a one nothing game. So Iwamura with a big two-run home run there in the eighth inning. Uh, the Rays were down 1-0, one, one and they went on to win by the score of 2-1 to one on that home run by Iwamura. So the Rays won the first two games of the series, and in game three, James Shields, big game James, took over on the mound. James Shields on the hill for the Rays, making his sixth start. Quick look at the scouting report. Of course, he's been trying to iron out some of the kinks in his delivery using some more two-seam fastballs down in the strike zone. And as always, that power strikeout changeup. There's a strike. took that pitch down around the knees. Ground ball, second base. Hockey. Four, six, three on the double play. He's the second coming of the God of One. Swing and a miss. Lugo with 133. Swing and a miss. Chris out on strikes. The 2-2. Two -two. Yeah. Strike three call. Swing on Euclid. Euclid chases this one. Navarro will have to flip it down to Pena, and that retires the side. One, two, three. And wave and a miss. Oh, yeah, call on the outside corner. He's retired the first two hitters in the ninth on just five pitches. And here's Justin Pedroia. against the Boston Red Sox and the Rays. So James Shields with the two hitter puts the Rays over the Red Sox. And this would be the first three game sweep of the Red Sox in Rays franchise history. Some very impressive play already uh, from the Tampa Bay Rays different and very out of their element. The Rays were 16 and 12 after play on May 1st 
putting them in a tie for the AL East with the Red Sox and the Orioles were also a half game behind. And this was the first time in franchise history that they were above 500 after the month of April. So this is already the most hope they've ever had as a franchise. And now we head into the month of May, where there's some May flowers in Florida. And on May 8th, the Tampa Bay Rays were in the 13th inning in Toronto. After Carl Crawford gave Tampa the extra inning lead, Deonor Navarro, who you may know from him getting traded for Randy Johnson, uh, looked to extend the lead. By the way, if you're watching on YouTube, get ready for some high camera quality from 2008. 3-2 pitch on the way. And it's ripped to right field. Rios is over there, and that ball is gone. My goodness, a grand slam home run, and this game is busted wide open by Deonor Navarro. And now everybody's heading for the exits. So Deonor Navarro gives the insurance that uh, – Pretty much ends the game there in a clutch situation for the Tampa Bay Rays. So on May 9th, James Shields was at it again and probably had a very visually appealing uh, performance that's not available. Shields remains the only pitcher in Rays history with the game he had on May 9th to have multiple complete game shutouts with less than three hits allowed in a season. And the Rays won that game in the bottom of the ninth on an Evan Longoria walk-off home run. That also isn't available. Which is also not available to the public. It's a shame. And the, and the Rays went on two separate four-plus four plus game win streaks during the month, giving them a record of 19-10 and 10 in the mo- on the month. They finished the month of May – 34 and 22 in total up one game in the American league East. And one with these rays, once they're hot, they're feisty. And it took 10 years for the rays to catch this kind of fire. And it ended up being taken out on the Boston Red Sox on June 5th of 2008. Shields hits crisp, and Coke Cole is going to head out. Here we go. And just like that, it turns into fight night at Fenway Park. the Boston Red Sox uh, Johnny Gomes got some good shots in there on uh, on Coco Crisp and you know I guess usually the bad teams don't really don't really fight so maybe this was a sign uh, was from the Marlins here, uh, wait what, what did you remember say? that Marlins Nationals fight from that one year um I'm 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 forgetting. Oh, Nigel Morgan, I think. I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's coming up. But, you know, the Rays were definitely De- – Rays had uh, – I mean, I guess the Red Sox started the fight, but they had a little more confidence about them. They knew that, you know, other teams had them on their mind. And from here, the Rays went on a really good pitching run from June 17th through July 6th. And they went 15-3 and three during this time. As a whole, 
They led the majors in F4 during this time with 4.6, and they led the American League in FIP with a 3.28. And as a rotation, they had a 2.76 ERA with a 252 BABIP against, make getting outs even when they're not striking guys out. And as a bullpen, they were tied for second in the majors in F4 with a 1.4, and they had a seven, uh, 1.74 ERA, that bullpen. A very, very good performance from them. Matt Garza, you know, going over for individuals, Matt Garza was 2-1 and one with a 1.64 ERA, 2.22 FIP, 1.23 walks per nine, and he was the only pitcher in the American League during this time with a FIP below 2.50 and less than 1.45 walks per nine. And Andy Sonnenstein went 3-0 and with a 2.25 ERA and no home runs allowed in 24 innings pitched. And James Shields himself went 3-0 and with a 2.70 ERA and 9.1 strikeouts per nine. And Grant Balfour, out of the bullpen, that great bullpen who had a 1.74 team ERA, in 10 and a third innings pitched, he led all relievers in F4 and ERA with a 0.00. Did not allow an earned run. He led all American League relievers during this time in strikeouts per nine with 13.94 and also had an a 0.62 FIP and 0.74 walks per nine. And on July 1st, the Rays were once again facing the Red Sox and the, the Sox having the bases loaded with a one run deficit in the eighth with two outs. And the Rays called upon that man who had not given up an earned run over this time to get that save. Ball four gets the call with two men on and two men out in the eighth. Makes his 12th appearance for the Rays. Two. And a bouncing ball to short. Mark gets thrown to first. Red Sox leave him loaded. Rays get out of the jam. In the head of Euclid. He struck him out. Fastball. Three, two. He got him. He struck him out. Fastball out. second straight night so grant balfour uh showing what he was doing during that stretch being amazing with the four out save to uh perform in a high levered situation against their biggest competitors so now comes the time where the rays sort of back into the all-star break in just one week the rays turned a five game division lead into a half game deficit before the All-Star break, after they lost seven straight to the Royals, Yankees, and Indians, the offense scored just 11 runs in those seven games. And ultimately, the Rays entered the All-Star break with a 55-39 and 39 record. Still very good, by all means. In fact, they also had three All-Stars, which is the most they've ever had as a franchise to that point. They were Evan Longoria, Deanna Navarro, and Scott Casimir. Those are the people who represented the Tampa Bay in the All-Star game. And Longoria, no doubt about it. He had the 10th highest position player F4 in the majors with a 3.8. He was also the only player in the American League to have an offensive rating and a defensive rating above 10 during the first half, according to Fangraph. So he was playing at a very impressive style for just a rookie. Very versatile. Deanna Navarro had the second highest weighted runs created plus among AL catchers with just 250 plate appearances with a 113. Which was plus one guy was losing his shooting power. There's no shame in that. He was also had a good 10 uh, to go along with it, so he was deserving as well. He wasn't qualified for stats, but he had 3.04 ERA, which was ninth in the American League among 58 pitchers with at least 80 innings pitched. And Longoria had taken the league by storm during his rookie season, and he brought that same energy to the national stage in the Bronx 
for the home run derby. Nine million votes. And unlike Sizemore and Ugla, his first swings don't result in home runs. That one to right center. And it does leave a little opposite field power from Evan Longoria. The Christians and the Lions. And this one is down the line. to nobody. He can make every play a third baseman needs to make. This one is way back. And he seems to have been able to relax after he made seven yes. outs. Yeah. So Longoria will end with the number on his back. Three. So Evan Longoria hits three home runs. He didn't end up winning it or advancing, but I mean, what are you going to do when Josh Hamilton uh, did what he did that year? And in the All-Star game, it's weird to be And wouldn't you know it, Evan Longoria came up with a man on trying to tie the game. The 2-2. Longoria hooks it down the left field line. It is fair. In the score is Sizemore. It's a double for the rookie Longoria, and it's a 3-3 game in the eighth. What a year for Evan Longoria. Joe Creedy in there. Yeah, shout out to Joe Creedy, White Sox legend, postseason legend as a whole. <laughs> that guy was awesome. Um, so Evan Longoria ties the game for the American League, and this is obviously big because this is when the All-Star game determined World Series home field advantage because uh, it was that time, which was really weird. Anyway, he went. he obviously got a big hit. Navarro also went one for four with a walk, and Scott Casimir picked up the win in a 15th inning American League victory. So all three of them are contributing victory. And this is where the Rays are turning forward. After the U.S. Army, the Rays went 8-5 and five from the start of the second half through the end of July. The Red Sox went 4-8 and eight over that same time period. And on August 3rd, the Rays were in a walk-off situation against the Detroit Tigers with the bases loaded and two men out in the 10th. First baseman Carlos Pena was looking to win it. So Carlos Pena with the legendary walk-off walk. And by the way, Carlos Pena was incredible at taking walks in that season. And we'll learn more about that later. Uh, Three days later, the Rays were down seven to four in the ninth inning against the Indians. And Tampa Bay was looking to stage a rally. Jerry Kinski and a ground ball. That's a fair ball. Up the right field line and back into the corner. Here comes Bartlett in to score. Pinsky in at second with the two base hit, and that makes it seven to five. He can delivers. Rose leads. Pitch it high and deep and gone. You believe this? Rose hits a two run home run, and this game is tied seven seven. Dave Rose almost hit that one to the back wall on two sides, the side in which he hit it and the side that hit against the lower edge of the back wall. Here's Pena. He swings and hits one. High and deep into center. Rays win. Rays win it. A three-run home run by Carlos Pena. And the Rays, unbelievably, have come back to win this game with a six-run ninth inning. So Carlos Pena with his second walk-off in just three days. And Chris, those two walk-offs were a a big difference in energy in that stadium just by, you know, virtue of what he did. Yeah, two two polar opposite events in terms of uh, entertainment. Yeah, walk-off walk and then a walk-off home run. Still, both get the win. 
Yeah, hey, a run's a run, a win's a win, and we're all happy at the end of the day. And with the offense providing, the pitching kept doing the same. On August 15th, uh, just a couple weeks after that walk-off, Matt Garza went out and performed against Texas. One as they face Matt Garza. We'll scout him out courtesy of Rico. Yeah, Matt Garza's having a nice season. He's nine and seven, a solid ERA. Bottom He's... of the second inning. And Boggs is going to take strike three call. Uh, hard slider. You don't see many pictures of him nowadays when he was younger and slim. This is true. Well, even the, the mighty base. Well, Kevin, I've seen those guys in quite a while. And sometimes you see them at things like this, but not this year. Been ahead of a lot of Ranger hitters tonight. He's going to strike out Kinsler. On the road, he has a losing record, and his ERA is 537, but you wouldn't know it by the way he's pitching on the road. Today. That is Man. one nasty breaking ball with advantage to the hitter. But now he just keeps moving his fingers. Hachi Machi. This guy has got it going. Strike three to Vasquez. Ooh, I don't know about that. Strike three to Davis. Boy, he's still airing it out, too. Mid 90s. Hamilton, line drive, ball game's over. Garza gets his complete game shutout. Your final tonight is Tampa Bay's seven. And the Texas Rangers, nothing. So Matt Garza with a two hitter on his of his own. And uh, the 2008 Rays remain the only American League team since the year 1978 to have three starts during the season with nine innings pitched, zero runs allowed, two or less hits, and a game score of at least 89. Once again, that is the only team in the American League since 1978 to do so. Really impressive stuff there from the from the OA Rays. And the Rays ended up going 21-7 and seven during the month of August. That is Without it out, the best record in the majors. During the month, the Rays led the majors in weighted runs created plus with a 124. And one guy who particularly destroyed the league during that time was Carlos Pena. He slashed 278, 450, 639, and then 1089 for his OPS with a 454 Woba, a 184 weighted runs created plus, and a 21.7% walk rate that led the American League. And the Rays went into the month of September with a five and a half game lead in the division. So then the Rays are coasting to the finish. And the Rays got off uh, to a struggle some start in September, losing six of their first seven games. Uh, by September 8th, their five and a half game lead had actually shrunk to a half game lead after a loss to the Red Sox. <laughs> And on September 9th, the Rays were trailing the Red Sox and were three outs away from losing the division lead. And Dan Johnson came up in the ninth inning trying to get rid of that or trying to save that division lead. In the air to right field, struck well. Back goes Kotze towards the bullpen. It's gone. Dan Johnson welcomes himself to the big leagues with the Rays. 42 big league home runs with the Oakland A's. First with the Rays goes out of the yard and ties the game 4-4 four four in the ninth. So Dan Johnson ties up the game, saving the division lead for the moment. And later in the inning, Deonor Navarro looked to give Tampa Bay the lead in the game. Begin the nine, ties the game. Navarro down the left field line. It is a fair ball and to the corner. As around from second base comes Perez to give the Rays the lead in the ninth. So, one second. So, DeAndre Navarro gives them the lead, and the Rays won that game 5-4 to four and maintained that division lead. A week later, 
the division was tied with the Red Sox playing in uh, Tropicana Field. The Rays needed to take back the division lead, and Navarro hit a walk-off single to put them back in front. And days later, on September 20th, the Rays looked to put a bow on this historic regular season. Fly ball, left field. Caught! Bottom fishers no more. The Rays are going to the playoffs. So the Rays officially, for the first time in their franchise history, will be going into the postseason. And the Rays finished 97-65 and 65 and won the American League East. So they would not be a wild card team. They would be hosting in the playoffs. So now, before the postseason, we're going to look at our Rays of Sunshine. The first one, of course, is Evan Longoria, who deservingly won the unanimous American League Rookie of the Year award, slashing 272, 343, 530, for an 874 OPS in his rookie season with 27 home runs, 85 RBI. And he led qualifying rookies that season in F4 with 5.6, weighted runs created plus with 129, slugging percentage, which was already mentioned, home runs, ISO with 259, and he also got 11th in the MVP vote. Carlos Pena had a big season, 247, 377, 494, 871, for a 129 OPS plus, 31 home runs, 100, 102 RBI, and 96 walks. His 15.8% walk rate was second in the American League. He was – no, very few people in the American League were better at taking walks than Carlos Pena this season. Also, let's look at the rotation because James Shields, big game James, was, was crushing it. 14-8 and eight record, 3.56 ERA, 124 ERA plus, 215 innings pitched, and a 1.7 walks per nine. He was very good at controlling his pitches. Scott Casimir, he spent some time on the disabled list, but overall had a very good season for himself. 12 and 8 record, a 349 ERA, 127 weighted or uh, ERA plus, and 152 and a third innings pitch, just, just off from qualifying, and 9.8 strikeouts per nine. Also, Matt Garza with 11 and 9 record, a 3.7 ERA, 119 ERA plus, and 184.2 innings pitched. Now let's look at the bullpen. J.P. Howell had himself a season, a 2.22 ERA, an 89 and a third innings pitched, a 199 ERA plus, and 9.3 strikeouts per nine. And also Grant Hall for the season, a 154 ERA, 287 ERA plus, and 12.7 Ks per nine. He produces a season in Tampa Bay Rays history. 50 plus days pitched, a 280 ERA plus, and a 35% strikeout percentage. A fantastic season from Grant Balfour. Also, rookie David Price had a 193 ERA and 14 innings pitch, which was pretty impressive. And Joe Madden, very predictably, won manager of the year. So now, before we get to the playoffs, there is one thing that we need to address. This has been addressed on this show before. We need to talk about the Jason Bartlett controversy because man, oh man, when we made this, we should talk about making this discovery uh, last year, but this is just such a puzzling thing uh, to wrap your head around. He had 494 plate appearances on the season. So he was just qualifying. But even if he did, it doesn't matter. For the year he slashed 286, 329, 361 for a 690 OPS. Uh, he had 83 OPS plus with one home run, 37 RBI, and 20 stolen bases to go with a 1.7 B WAR. Which you know, this is not by any means bad. I mean, I don't think much, many people expected anything more out of Jason Bartlett this season, especially as a middle infielder. But he got 18, 18th in the MVP vote. He got MVP votes for a 1.7 B WAR season with a 690 OPS and 83 OPS plus. Uh, Chris, you want to talk about how he found this a little 
close to a year ago now? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There was there one, was um, one night, it was a, it was a Saturday in like February or something like that. And, uh, we were just like looking at random, random baseball stuff. And I was thinking about like the best, best high schools in, um, in like baseball, the, the high schools that, the high schools that led to the most MLB success. So there was some article with like, uh, you know, multi, uh, high schools with multiple all-stars and, uh, Jason Bartlett was on, was, went to one of those high schools that had multiple players that came out of it that ended up being all-stars. And I was like, Jason Bartlett went to an all-star game. Like, I just remember this guy hitting out of the nine hole for the, for the Tampa Bay Rays. And, uh, you know, I went to the, I went, we went to the baseball reference page and we saw MVP 18 in his, in the awards column. And it wasn't even his best season no. that, that occurred. The, the following season, he had, he actually had a season where he deserved MVP votes. And he did not I have get... it pulled up right here if you want the stats. Yeah. So I'll, I... I'll compare everything to what I already mentioned. His 494 plate appearances in 2008 uh, paled in comparison to his 567 in 2009, the next year. His one home run from uh, 2008, try again. He had 14 in 2009. His 37 RBI, no, 66. His 20 stolen bases, how about 30? Let's up it to 10. His slash line went from 286, 329, 361, 690 to a 320, 389, 490, 879. His, his, ERA, his OPS plus went from 83 to 132. It almost went up by 50 points. And he even made the All-Star game this year. So he was better on all sides of the field. I'm pretty sure he had a better D-War as well. Oh, yeah, yeah he I did. Know. He sure did. Uh, and he had the third best. He had the third best uh, wins above replacement B war on his own team, and the eighth best among position players in the league. I'm pretty sure. And this is not the year that he got MVP consideration, which is just really weird. Yeah, yeah, he finished eighth in position player B war in the American League, and he finished uh, tenth in F war. Uh, I looked it up today, and yeah, uh, you know, we we wrote a. We wrote a letter. To, we wrote an email to Baseball Reference. We did ask, asking if they got something wrong, but they didn't. I guess it was the voters. The voters got got something wrong. I don't know. Well, that wouldn't be the first time that happened, or the last. Yeah. Definitely not. Shout out to Ryan Tapera. Um, <laughs> maybe maybe there is someone else with the with the last name starting with B, who uh, got where he just you know got I don't I don't know, but uh, that's that's the Jason Bartlett story of 2008 slash 2009. Truly iconic one at that. Yes. So now the Rays are going into the postseason for the first time in franchise history, and they are facing the Chicago White Sox. And in game one, this was the first postseason game in Rays history, and the guy who put them on the map this year got the party started and kept it going. Leads it off here in the second inning and gets into this one to deep left. Wise back looking up. The Rays strike first. Tampa Bay is on top one nothing. Well, the young man's got a flair for the dramatic. You know, I, I, I wasn't joking in the open when I talked about it. It reminds me of Cal Ripken Jr. Soft breaking ball has hit a ton up near the catwalks. High, deep, far, and gone. Two at bats, two home runs for Evan Longoria. Welcome to the postseason, Evan Longoria. Is it that easy? Wow. He had a fastball, and this time he hits a breaking pitch. He's special. Left side by the guy, the Cabrera into left. Upton's going to try and score. Wise with the throw, and it's not in time. The Rays have their lead on top, 5-3. to three. Longoria again. Get the left hand. That's what they did. Give him nothing to hit. There he goes. Takes off, and they got him, but they can convert, but they can't. Camargo. 
Finally hung up in the turf there a little bit. So Evan Longoria doing it all for the Rays in this game, his first postseason game, the franchise's first postseason game, and he remains the only infielder in postseason history with three hits, two home runs, three RBIs, and a stolen base in a single game. And behind Longoria, the Rays win six to four, and uh, they're undefeated all time in the playoffs. I don't mean, I don't know who's counting, but uh, they are. And then in game two, the White Sox got off to an early 2-0 lead, but Tampa Bay chipped away after Deanna Navarro singled. The game stayed 2-1 for a while, and in the fifth, Akinori Iwamura came up with a man on first. As a, a nation as a whole, and they've done a great job playing baseball with them. Iwamura lifts it to deep left center field. Swisher and Anderson headed back, and it is gone! For Akinori Iwamura to put the Rays on top, three to two. So Akinori Iwamura gets the Rays on top, three to two. Later in the eighth, with the same score, Carl Crawford looked to add insurance for Tampa Bay. He has. He's, he's done his job. Crawford to left field. It's in for a hit, and Crawford's done his job. From third comes Upton. The Rays tack on an insurance run. They lead it four to two. So Carl Crawford gets some insurance, tacks on for the Rays, and they would get two more runs in the inning on RBIs from Rocco Baldelli and Deanna Navarro. The Rays end up winning the game six to two. And they are one game away from clinching going into the south side of Chicago. So now in game three, the Rays took the lead in the second inning on an RBI single by Iwamura. However, Matt Garza kind of struggled with this one. He gave four runs and four innings. And later in the top of the seven, a 5-1 game, DJ Upton chipped away with a two-run home run. But unfortunately, it wouldn't be enough. The White Sox end up winning 5-3, to three and they live to see another day. So now we go to game four. The Rays had a second clinch opportunity, and B.J. Upton wanted a playoff series win, uh, and he had a home run to put the Rays on top 1-0 quickly. And in the bottom of the first, A.J. Pruszynski for the White Sox was looking to tie it. All the time. You have to be in there to really get it. Pruszynski to deep right field. Gabe Gross is headed back out of the track at the wall. Leaps! And makes the catch in right field. Gabe Gross times the leap and makes the grab to rob A.J. Pierzynski. Well, A.J. took a great swing. He's sitting on a breaking pitch, and he drove this ball, and Gabe Gross made a nice play himself. Watch him get back. He knows exactly where the wall is, and he brings one back. So a great play there in right field by Gabe Gross. And the Rays scored five runs in the first five innings on RBIs from Upton with two home runs, Cliff Floyd, Deanna Navarro, and Carlos Pena. Eventually in this game, it was up to Grant Balfour. 2-2 to Griffey. Struck him out. In the postseason for the first time, the Tampa Bay Rays are headed to the American League Championship Series. So the Rays defeat the Ken Griffey Jr.-led Chicago White Sox and move on to the American League Championship Series. In the division series, B.J. Upton did a great job with slashing 278, 316, 889 for a 1205 OPS with three home runs, four RBI, and one walk. Also, Akinori Iwamura uh, did big things for Tampa, slashing 389, 421, 720, 722, for an 11.43 OPS, he had one home run, four RBIs, and one walk. Also, Carlos Pena slashed 500, 545, 500 for a 10.45 OPS with two RBI. Deanna Navarro, the catcher, an all-star catcher, 400, 438, 600, 1038 
with three RBI. And lastly, Evan Longoria, you knew he was going to be here. He slashed 267, 377 for a 1020 OPS, two home runs, three RBI, and two stolen bases. And the Rays are going to the ALCS against the Boston Red Sox. And now on to the American League Championship Series. And they're playing against the defending champion Boston Red Sox. And in game one, in a game that was a pitcher's duel between James Shields and Daisuke Matsuzaka, big game James blinked first, giving up runs on RBI from Jed Lowry and Kevin Euclid. And uh, yeah, he gave up RBI from uh, Jed Lowry and Kevin Euclid, and that gave Boston everything they needed. And the Red Sox won two to nothing. And then in game two, the Red Sox took an early early two nothing lead on a double from Jason Bay. In the next half inning, Evan Longoria looked to tie the game. Swing. Evan Longoria comes up big and ties the game for the trailing Rays. And later on, it was a 4 nothing Rays game. 4-3. Uh, 4-3 Rays game. And Cliff, Lloyd, Cliff Floyd <laughs> was looking to add some insurance. Swing and a drive, deep center field. Back goes Chris. Track, wall, ceiling. And the Rays are now up five to three. And Eventually, after the teams traded runs, traded runs back and forth, the game went to extras. Eventually, in the 11th inning, DJ Upton won the game for the Rays with a walk-off sack fly. And then in game three, with the series tied, the series had shifted to Fenway, and the Rays went on an absolute power surge. the ball in play good things can happen as it does here a towering fly ball deep left field that one is gone a three-run homer bj upton and the rays have broken it open early That's the one thing I've not seen from Lester so far is the ability to get the ball inside. It always served him well this year, and so far he's not been able to get that ball in. 2-2 two, two count. Driven left center field and deep as well. That one's got a chance to go, and it does. Longoria unloads with a solo home run. It's 5-0 Rays in the third. Trying to go down and away, and that ball cut right out over the heart of the plate to get no stride. Look at the torque from contact beyond. Tremendous extension as he drives it into the monitor sheets and puts the raise up by five. You saw a lot of guys stealing third. As that ball crushed, deep left and high off the Sports Authority sign. A long home run for Rocco Baldelli. A three-run shot. Eight runs for the Rays. It's eight to one. 
And the Fenway faithful head for the exits. Well, what a moment for Rocco Baldelli. He grew up in Rhode Island, grew up a Red Sox fan, probably dreamed playing wiffle ball many times of hitting one over the Green Monster. And just a beautiful level swing. That ball a little in on him, but he got the hands inside that baseball. A lot three home runs in this game, consecutive games. Pena hits a towering fly ball to left that carries and carries and carries and carries out of the ballpark. It's a home run. Carlos Pena unloads. And the Rays front office is loving every minute of this. It's 9 to 1 at Fenway Park. So the Rays hit four home runs uh, to power them to a 9 to 1 victory, giving them the 2 1 series lead. And in game four, the Rays came out absolutely firing in this game. They scored five runs in the first three innings on home runs from Carlos Pena, Evan Longoria, and Willie Ibar. In the sixth inning, the Rays finished the job on RBI from B.J. Upton, Evan Longoria, Carl Crawford, Willie Ibar, and DeAndre Navarro. And the Rays won that game 13-4, to putting them one game away from clinching the American League pennant. And the Rays could clinch on in game five, and B.J. Upton was absolutely ready. By the way, for those listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you're going to have to explain what happened because they're not going to be able to really understand it on the broadcast. Yeah, and we're going we're gonna to show you why. Y se llevaron el clásico los metropolitanos en siete juegos. Palo grande para Jardín Izquierdo. La bola se va, se va y está del otro lado. B.J. Upton lo vuelve a hacer. Cuadrangular del jardinero central y segundo en la alineación de Tampa. Se lleva por delante a Kinori Iwamura. Y las mantarrayas otra vez tienen ventaja tempranera en el Fenway. Dos carreras por cero. So for those who didn't understand, BJ Upton just hit a just hit a home run, two run home. The only run. the only highlights I could find of this game was in a Spanish broadcast. So I was like, you know what, we're gonna do it. Yes. So, also, because like Spanish Spanish uh, calls are always electric. Yes, they are. But like are. you know, if if you're listening on radio, you're not gonna understand what's going on if you don't speak the language. Yeah, exactly. But they're uh, it's, they're good. It's, they're great. They're fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so BJ Upton hit. That was a two-run homer, correct? Yes. Two-run homer to make it two to nothing. And a couple innings later, Carlos Pena looked to tack on for the Rays. Sí. Están en las carreras. Palo sólido para el derecho. Se fue. Home run. Uno más de Tampa. Cuatro a cero. Peña estremece al Sacasan. Otra película de largometraje llevándose por delante a Opton. Estamos 4 por 0. Y sigue. So, for those who didn't understand, well, Carlos, they said home run in that one. They did say home run. Yeah. Uh, that was um, down the right field line. That was a two. Two run homer, uh, yes, two run home run from Carlos Pena. And the Rays were not done yet. The batter after him was Evan Longoria. Parangulares, el primer equipo de las mayores, a lo sólido para el izquierdo. Adiós. Longoria, cuadrangulares, espalda con espalda. Bueno, decía hace un momento si conectaban un home run más. Bueno, pues ahora ya son cuatro partidos seguidos en los que Tampa tiene por lo menos tres home runs. Sexto cuadrangular en la post. So, Evan Longoria hits a home run to left to make it a 5-0 ball game. 
And later in the seventh inning, B.J. Upton came up. He was not satisfied. He looked up, came up looking for even more. Batazo profundo para Jardín Izquierdo. Y la pelota va de aire contra la barda. Así que vienen dos carreras más para Home. 7 a 0. Doblete para Opton. Bueno, hasta Papelbon le pega. Pero fue un batazo salvaje. Y no le hicieron la primera carrera en postempo. So BJ Upton hits a two run double to make it 7 0. Rays. And in the bottom of the seventh, the Red Sox put one run on the board. And they had two on for Mr. David Ortiz. Swing and a drive. Deep right field. If it's fair, it is way out of here. So now it's a three-run ball game in Boston. So the Red Sox went out to tie the game in the eighth and give them an opportunity to possibly win the game in the bottom of the ninth. And J.D. Drew looked to win a game that seemed over about an hour ago. Mitchell, winning run at second, 3-1. Swing, line drive, right field. We're going to Tampa. Ah. Uh. Warms my heart. Anyway. Do you remember that game at all? Uh, I remember going to bed early because I was. You thought it was over, early. yeah. School well, yeah. I, I was, even if the Red Sox were winning, I, wa I wasn't allowed to stay up that late because the game. Yeah, it was a school night. You got to. Yeah, you had first grade tomorrow. Yeah, I, second grade. But, you know. I, I was in second grade as well. I just made up a <laughs> year. You know, there's a difference, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I had uh, we had uh, we had times tables the next day. Yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't stay up for that. No, I, I didn't start uh, multiplication until I was in third grade. So oh, uh, interesting. Uh, I was learning. Uh, I don't know what I was learning. I think I was learning a little bit about nature, what was going on in uh, the natural yeah. world. Yeah. Um, but it does warm my heart to see some David Ortiz and JD Drew clutch hitting. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I. Uh, I remember definitely thinking that game was over and going to bed and waking up uh, happy about the news. And then in game six, the Rays needed to sway momentum back their way. And BJ Upton had an early opportunity to do so. Con calma, el pitcher de Media Roja. Palo sólido, profundo, al izquierdo. So BJ Upton hits a solo home run to left field, putting the Rays on top one to nothing. And the Red Sox, however, took the lead on two RBI from Kevin Euclid. And in the fifth, Jason Bartlett had a chance to prove that he deserved that MVP consideration. Two 
dos y dos. Palo sólido. La pelota se va. Y se fue. El partido se empató. Le pescó la curva a Bartlett. A Beckett, dos iguales. So Jason Bartlett hits a solo home run to left field to tie the game two to two. Dos a dos. And unfortunately for the Rays, James Shields gave up two earned runs in the sixth, and the Red Sox won that game four to two. So after after uh leading seven nothing in game five, pretty much right on their way to winning the AL pennant. They were in a game seven situation and the Rays got off to a rough start as Dustin Pedroia hit a solo home run in the first inning. After that, Matt Garza and John Lester seemed to be very settled in. In the fourth inning, Akinori Iwamura hit a leadoff single and Evan Longoria came up with two outs in order to drive the leadoff man in. This is wild two and two. Line down the right field line. Will it stay fair? It will. Pena around second on his way to third. They're going to wave it. Here comes the relay for Pedroia. Up the line and not in time or time. So a tie game for the Tampa Bay Rays. And the Rays got to a big start in the uh, – got the Rays got a big start to the fifth inning on a Willie Ibar double and a Deion Navarro single. Then Rocco Baldelli came up looking to give Camp, uh, Tampa Bay a game seven lead. So the Rays now officially have the lead in another clinching game. And the Rays were up, and they, but they still needed some insurance. And Willie Ibar looked to provide just that insurance that they needed. Swing and drop. Deep left. So the Rays are now up by two and uh, while this was all happening, Matt Garza was absolutely dominated. There was a reason that that game was still two to one when that home run happened. One of the heroes for the Tampa Bay Rays in Fenway Park in that third game was Matt Garza, who beat John Lester, only gave up a run in six innings with five strikeouts. One of the keys for Garza, though, when he is on this year, two shutouts, three complete games, those shutouts, a one-hit shutout and a two-hit shutout. And drives that one deep into the left field corner. Crawford on the run. That ball is gone. A home run, and the Red Sox lead. Check swing, he went around. Navarro will make the peg to first. Check swing, Bay is retired. 
Second strikeout for Garza, one away. Ninth pitch of the at bat is a breaking ball. Two down. Struck him out with high heat. They've got plenty of cowbell, now they need some runs. In game seven tonight. Hitting over. Three up, three down, seven strikeouts, and he's the inning. He's going. Swing and a miss. Throw to second. Struck him out. Throw him out. Between high. And will the raised defense cost them dearly late? The door is open in the eighth inning. Matt Garza allowed two hits to the defending world champions in a decisive game seven. He leads with the lead and a tip of the cap. So Matt Garza, noted former New Britain Rock Hat, comes up big and uh, goes almost eight innings with just one run allowed. And after Garza departed, the Rays went through a carousel of relievers until David Price was called upon. David Price was looking to stop the bleeding. What a spot to put this young man. He made his debut in the major leagues on September 14th at none other than Yankee Stadium. is a walk and the tying run potentially to the plate with nobody out. That one on the outside corner. Two out. So David Price gets three of the first four batters out and then the Rays had one out left to get. Ground ball to second. Ewan Murrow's got it. Rays are going to the World Series. Just like that, the Rays are going to the World Series. And the uh, the uh, men who made that possible, Matt Garza, won American League Championship Series MVP, went 2-0 with 13 innings pitch and a 1.38 ERA with four, 14 strikeouts. B.J. Upton was also spectacular. Slashing 321, 394, 786 for an 1180 OPS. <clears throat> he had four home runs and 11 RBI and four walks. That says walks, right? Yeah. Four walks. And Willie Ibar slashed 421, 421, 789 for a 1211 OPS with two home runs and six RBI. Evan Longoria 
was also very, very good. A lot of home runs, slash 259, 333, 815 for an 1148 OPS with four home runs, eight RBI, and three walks. And Carlos Pena, slash 269, 406, 654 for a 1060 OPS. He had three home runs, six, six RBI, and went with the theme of the regular season with six walks in seven games. So now they are onto the fall classic. They're playing the Philadelphia Phillies, another team that we've gone over on this history series. Yes, yes. Uh, episode 43. There you go. Two. So the Rays got off to a tough start in game one as Chase Utley hit a two-run home run in the first. And after the Phillies were already up 3 nothing, Carl Crawford came up looking to chip away. To do a whole lot of walking out to the mound to do any visiting. I, I'd rather not go out to that mound if I don't have to. Uh, occasionally just to slow him up a little bit, but he's been very good for us. And, uh, He's just uh, beginning to, you know, touch his potential. Well, as we hear from Rich Doobie, Carl Crawford gets one into right, and the Rays get that run right back. Hamels gives it up. It's 3-1 to one, Philadelphia on a home run by Carl Crawford. Gotta love the classic home run during an in-game interview with someone on the opposing team. Uh, yeah. <laughs> those, are, those are my favorite. Yes, for sure. Uh, A.J. Hinch in uh, 2018 against the Red Sox is the ultimate example of that. I mean, this one was during the World Series. Yeah, I mean, imagine if that was like a, a go-ahead or a or a, yeah. a game tie-in. That would have been insane. That, or imagine if they were interviewing Charlie Manuel. They weren't. Yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> yeah, it could have been. I don't, know, I don't know. Who agrees to that during a World Series game, especially when your team isn't hitting? Like I would understand doing it when your team is hitting because, you know, if if you hit into an out while you're while you're on air, that happens. You're supposed to do it 27 times a game, but a home run, that's tough. Yeah, it is for sure. So the Phillies are the Phillies are now up three to one, and in the next inning, the Rays had a runner on, and the batter was Akinori Iwamura. Iwamura into left center field. It's a one-run game. Two-out action for the Rays. It's 3-2. So the Rays chip away. It's now a one-run game, but unfortunately it wouldn't be enough as the Phillies went on to win the game 3-2. So now on to game two. The Rays needing to break even going into Philly. And the Rays got up to a much stronger start in this one, getting runs on ground outs from Pena and Longoria. And later in the second, B.J. Upton looked to tack on. And a line drive into right. It's a base hit. One run scores. They bring Baldelli to the plate, and he is out. Ruiz hangs on. After a perfect throw from Jason Worth. So a great play, but the Rays still score a run. And later on in the fourth, our man, Jason Barlow, is looking for some of that MVP potential magic. I think Ibar was the hitter at the time. Here it is again. At least a safety squeeze. And in the score is Floyd. It's 4-0. It's a good call, Joe, because that's exactly what it was. Twice in a row, Joe Madden puts the squeeze on. The first was fouled off. And then Bartlett butted the ball toward first base. You can see a cautious Cliff Floyd at third. And when the ball goes to th- first, he scores easily. So once again, Jason Barlow with some of that MVP potential. And after Shields and Dan Wheeler were both dealing in this game, David Price looked to finish off a seven-out save for Tampa. To the right side, Iwamura. Rays take game two.
So the Rays get a victory in the World Series, and the series is now tied at one going into Pennsylvania. And in Game 3, after the Phillies grabbed a quick one nothing lead, Gabe Gross looked to even it in the second. Here's a 2-1. And he lifts one into right center field back. I got it, He's I got it, I got it. Victorino who says he's got it. He does. Tagging and scoring is Crawford. The stolen base pays off, and this game is tied at one. And another thing that paid off with Joe Madden putting in Gabe Gross. So Gabe Gross in the lineup tonight produces for his team with a sack fly. The Phillies, however, retook the lead the next inning on a Carlos Ruiz home run. Matt Garza and 45-year-old Dave Moyer just stagnant for a while until Garza gave up back-to-back home runs to Utley and Howard. Later in the seventh, Gabe Gross looked to get one back. One strike, second and third, nobody out. Gross hits it to first. Good pick by Howard. The race to the bag for the out. Crawford scores, and it's a 4-2 game. So a productive out by Gabe Gross, his second arm. So the Rays get a run on an RBI ground out, but uh, if you were watching on YouTube there, you would have noticed there was a runner on third still with less than two outs, and Jason Bartlett looked to bring him in. in the seventh. And a broken back ground ball to short. Out at first, in to score is Navarro. And it's a one-run game. Talked about a productive out. So it was now a one-run game, and in the eighth, the Rays were able to put the tying run in scoring position. Now Upton is running. Throw to third is not in time. Gets away, and this game is tied. The legs of B.J. Upton all the way around the bases. It's 4-4. So an error on the Phillies and some aggressive base running from B.J. Upton ties the game, and this game would go into the bottom of the ninth tied, but Grant Balfour was trying to get out of a jam in the bottom half of the inning. Strikeout pitch. Chop to third. Play at the plate. Phillies take game three. So the Phillies took game three on a walk-off. Nothing Evan Longoria really could have done on that play. I mean, it was just a slow chopper. He was kind of chasing the base runner and may have played in the same. But the Rays are now down in the series, and they would need to avenge another one in game or four or five to get back to Tampa. And in game four, Andy Schoenstein, uh struggled early, and the Phillies had a quick 2 nothing lead. In the fourth, Carl Crawford came up looking to chip away. Crawford hits one in the air to right. Back is worth at the wall. It's gone, and the lead is cut in half. Crawford has his second home run of this postseason. It's 2-1. to one. Talked about Jimmy Rollins being the eye-opener for the Phillies. So Carl Crawford makes it a 2-1 to one Phillies lead. The Phillies got that run back and more in the bottom of the fourth on a Ryan Howard three-run home run. But Eric Hinsky still wanted to fight when he came up in the fifth inning. Tomorrow night, but as importantly, they'll be facing Cole Hamels. How about Hinsky off the bench? He goes deep to center field, and I mean deep. Off that back brick wall, and that makes it a three-run game. So they add Hinsky to the active roster. And in his first at bat, he goes deep to center off the bench. It's 5-2. So Eric Hinsky with his first postseason home run. And it's a 5-2 game, but the Rays pitching continued to struggle. And the Phillies ended up winning 10-2. So now the Rays are facing elimination. In game five, 
the Phillies took a 2-0 lead, and Evan Longoria came up in the fourth trying to cut it. One out. Mm-hmm. But not running hard to first, more watching. And now Longoria grounds one into left center. It doesn't matter. The combination of Pena and Longoria come up big. It's 2-1 to one as Evan Longoria gets his second RBI of this World Series and his first base hit. So Evan Longoria, he's been doing it all year, and he chops the lead in half. And uh, the Phillies uh, were still leading in the sixth, of course, but Carlos Pena came up looking to fix it. Line drives a base hit into left. Here comes Upton to the plate. Throw home by Burrell. This game is tied. Carlos Pena delivers with two out in the sixth. They've been waiting for Pena to find his stroke, and here tonight in game found in game five, he's found it. Game found, baby. Yeah. I don't know if, if you guys were watching on YouTube, I don't know if you could tell, but it was raining pretty hard at this point in the game. And the game was actually paused and resumed the very next night where they had left off. And after the Phillies had reached the lead, Paco Baldelli looked to retie it for Tampa. Is put in his lineup in that right field spot as Baldelli hits one into left. Back is Burrell, and Baldelli has tied it. Rocco Baldelli has gone deep. It's 3-3 in the top of the seventh. As Baldelli gets his first World Series hit and his second postseason home run. So Rocco Baldelli makes it a 3-3 game, uh, but the Phillies would take the lead back on a Pedro Feliz single. And later on in the ninth, the Rays were down to their final out, down by one. Two pitch, swing and a miss, struck him out. The Philadelphia Phillies are 2008 World Champions of Baseball. Brad Lynch does it again and stays perfect for the 2008 season. So the Phillies are awarded the 2008 World Series Championship and the Rays' hopes and dreams for the season are over. In the World Series, uh, the only really great performers on the team offensively was pretty much just Carl Crawford, who slashed 263, 300, 632, 932 with two home runs. And also James Shields pitched five innings and allowed zero earned runs. So the Rays, they didn't win the World Series, but we need to talk about their legacy because it is a good one in 2008. Uh, they took Tampa Bay out of the cellar. And I mean, in the 10 years that they had existed before this season, they had only gotten fourth once, and it was in 2004. Uh, every other year, they were in dead last in the division. It, the team was very, very, very around. Uh, they were not existent until 2008. The only thing they were known for was having we lost 2008. And this team finally gave him something that he had about. Not only did it come out of the cellar, but it introduced the city to winning baseball. Uh, this was the first season with at least 70 wins. Not only that, it was 97 wins. I mean, if you're going to ask for one great, you know, a good season to get you out of the cellar, you might as well ask for a 97-win season where you get to the World Series. Uh, and lastly, they flipped the script heavily on the Boston Red Sox. Uh, Chris, you said it to me privately the other night. You said that you thought that this was going to be an easy road to the World Series for the Red Sox. Uh, they were just going to have to go through the Rays, nothing much. And uh, the Rays – did it to them all regular season. You know, they swept them in April. Uh, they fought with them literally in June. They broke their hearts in September with the Dan Johnson home run. And everyone in the world thought that the Red Sox had all the momentum uh, after game six. I mean, the comeback win in game five, the comeback win the win game six, you had to have thought there was no way the Red Sox were losing that game, especially with their recent history of comebacks uh, in the playoffs. But the Rays... They stopped it. They they flipped the script and wrote their own. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, I'm uh, old enough to remember like what it was like in uh, in 08. And yeah, like they 
the Red Sox had come back from 3-1 against the Indians in 07 in the ALCS, and obviously they came back from 3-0 in 2004. So it was like, yeah, of course, you know, and, you know, the Rays are going to get in the Red Sox way, and they did get in the Red Sox way, and they and they won it. Uh, you know, they really defied they really defied the odds. And like, there was no real reason why they should have won the division. You know, they, they they didn't have a good, any good seasons before then. And they didn't really add much besides Matt Garza and Jason Bartlett, who didn't have like great records beforehand. So yeah, it, it really was a team that didn't make sense, but they were definitely fun. They, they brought a winning culture to Tampa Bay. They introduced the, uh, I'm guessing that's when the cowbells kind of grew in popularity. Yeah. Um, By the way, that dome was rowdy. Like it really did get rowdy in the trop. Yeah, it, it did. Like it was, it was their first winning season and they, they finally kind of got a, got the city of Tampa Bay or St. Petersburg around them. Um, And yeah, they really did defy all the odds. You know, they didn't win the world series, but you know, they made, made the game, made the games competitive in it you know, really gave a bump up to their, to their franchise. It sure did. And it established Evan Longoria as their franchise player. Uh, like that was the first person in Tampa Bay Rays history, really, where you could look at it and look at him and be like, this guy has a long-term future in this city. And he did. Yeah. Like luckily. to this day, he is the franchise's greatest player. Yes, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we've talked about um, him in private, you know, he could be, uh, with a few more good seasons, possibly like the first uh, Ray to go into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, um, I mean, with the Ray, with the way the Rays handle their team now, it's hard to imagine anyone else going in with them in the near future. You know, Blake Snell was a guy who looked like he had a long-term future in Tampa, uh, but that's not happening anymore. Uh, yeah, un- unfortunately. So unless some new ownership happens or there's some sudden popularity with the team, um, yeah, Evan Longoria just seems to be the outlier there. Uh, mm-hmm. There's not not really a lot uh, a lot like him that stayed there for, you know, 10 or, yeah, he was there for 10 years, I think, right? Mm-hmm. But, yeah, um, is that does that wrap it up for the 2008 Tampa Bay Rays? It sure does. And now on to our favorite part of the episode where we decide the fate of our next week we only have five more of these segments left um so this list is ne- so small our uh yeah every five weeks we at, at first our list were 30 players and 30 teams long and after every five weeks we reshuffle and we're down to our last five so we're just picking a number one through five you can't even really get that creative um no. with uh with this one so you know at the beginning of as the story goes at the beginning of quarantine, uh, Daniel was like, let's talk about some players and 30 players and 30 teams until, you know, we get a baseball season. And uh, he did the teams. I did the players. And uh, now we're here. So Do you remember I, what the original idea was before this? Um, are you saying that like you? No, like I know it. it. Do you remember? Not exactly. We were going to go on over every individual Barry Bond season. Oh, yeah. We, that would have been we, so bad. We discussed it. I mean, like, <laughs> it would have... Uh, it would have been so repetitive. It would have been very repetitive, yeah. like, And it would have, yeah. the good parts wouldn't have come for, like, 15 weeks. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, especially, like, 80... Like, how are we, are we really going to do, like, an hour on Barry Bond's 1986? <laughs> yeah, where he's leading off for the pirates they're not doing anything no. um so i pick first this week right yeah so uh daniel will pick a number one through five he doesn't know what uh the list of players look like i will pick a number one through five as well i don't really know i don't know what the team what the uh, team situation looks like on the other end so daniel what player are we going to be talking about in our next history episode we're going to split it right down the middle and choose player number three player Number three. So, uh, you know, yesterday was the uh, Hall of Fame uh, election. And, you know, there were a lot of players in the past election cycle that 
have passed on from us. And one of the big ones uh, we will be talking about next week. He was the greatest pitcher of his era. He's the greatest player in Mets history. We're going to be talking about Tom Seaver. Yeah, Tom Seaver. Uh, he passed away last September. And uh, yeah, he was on the Miracle Mets. He was on the Reds for a brief period of time. He was on the Reds team that got screwed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he uh, he was yeah, he was on that 1981 Reds team. We're going to I'm going to have to send that to uh, our journalism professor who was a huge Tom Seaver fan. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We we got to do that. But yeah, we will be talking about uh, Tom Seaver next week. Um, you know, Randy Johnson, possibly lefty Grove, definitely the best pitcher of his era. Randy Johnson, possibly the best pitcher of his era. Well, like, you know, best clean pitcher of his era, uh, mm-hmm. very possibly. And Tom Seaver, you know, definitely defined the seventies, uh, for sure. And early 1980s. So kind of a, kind of a theme there. Uh, the team we will be talking about next week. Uh, next week, we'll talk about team number five. Team number five. We have gotten the first uh, NL West team since Randy Johnson's 01 Diamondbacks. Wow. We have a team that came out of absolutely nowhere to make the playoffs, and they turned it into one of the most impressive postseason runs in recent history. It is the 2007 Colorado Rockies. Another team with the Red Sox connection as well. Yeah, yeah this, yeah, that team. Um, they had to win like 21 out of 22 at some point. They were, they had an impossible run. They had an impossible Rocky Mountain to climb, and they did it. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I'm excited to. This is a team that had, uh, hopefully, soon to be Hall of Famer Todd, Todd Helton. It was the beginning of Troy Tulowitzki. They had Ubaldo Jimenez at, in the rotation. Brad Hopp was putting up one of the most interesting seasons ever that I'll explain more of. Um, yeah, Jeff yeah that team. Jeff, Jeff Francis, of course. <laughs> Seth Smith. <laughs> Seth Smith, Jared <laughs> Atkins, Yorvit Torrealba. <laughs> the 07 Rockies. Can't wait yep. for it. Uh, so we hope you enjoyed this episode of above replacement radio if you're listening on apple podcasts and spotify you're missing out go to our youtube channel subscribe to it and watch the videos with us subscribe it's called above replacement radio just like the show and also if you want to follow us on social media follow me on twitter at chris underscore gianta follow daniel on twitter and instagram at daniel underscore current and follow our show instagram at above replacement radio also we would like to thank Stathead, fan graphs uh M- and mlb on youtube for everything they provided for us all the information we needed and content we needed for this episode so uh we hope you enjoyed the 2008 tampa bay rays episode and we hope to see you next week where we're going to be breaking down all the all the latest MLB news and on Thursday where we'll talk about Tom Seaver and on Friday where we will be talking about the 2007 oh by the way Colorado Rockies this is the this is the year I forgot to mention this this is the year where Matt Holiday famously touched home plate oh right yes in the I, didn't, uh, I completely that blanked that almost slipped right by me before we ended the episode game 163 so mm-hmm. look forward to that in our next history episode. Get ready to see Matt Holiday touch home plate. Yes, we will see you then.